Today we consider the words of our gospel lesson taken from Luke chapter 5, and I will read a few selected verses from the end of the account again. But when Simon Peter saw the great catch of fish, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. We pray. Heavenly Father, these are your words. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends, in every part of the world, there are things that people expect of their pastors. In Africa, for example, people expect their pastors to travel a lot. Oftentimes, pastors will make the rounds to several villages where they serve congregations, and they'll do that on a bike or a motorcycle. In our Lutheran church in India, people expect their pastors to prepare and deliver a sermon every day during the season of Lent. 40 sermons in 40 days. They expect that. Here in America, many churches have an expectation of how long a sermon should be. You know, there's no mandate from God as to how long a sermon ought to last, but there's an expectation. Now, all these expectations we might call customs, and they're good customs. They help in the teaching of the gospel to do it in an orderly way, but they can vary by time and circumstance and place, and we recognize that. The role of pastor, on the other hand, is not an arbitrary one. It's not up to Christians whether or not they will have this public minister in their midst. We say with the Lutheran confessions, where the church is, there is the command to preach the gospel. Now, all Christians are called to share the gospel in their individual lives. But God also commands Christians as communities to call and ordain and support men in their midst who will serve them spiritually, who will lead the church. This command should be at the front of your minds right now because your pastor has left to serve a church elsewhere. I'll preface uh, the statements I'm going to make uh, with this, though. Um, I am very glad and grateful to God that I can be here serving you with the word. And there's nothing improper about uh, the arrangement. At the same time, I do not have a permanent call to this congregation, and I'm not ordained. I have no authorization to serve here beyond the end of November. That's the fact. Also, our erratic communion schedule and the fact that there's no one up here wearing the colored stole signals something to us. It says there is no full pastor over this flock right now. So sooner or later you in this congregation will call a pastor. And what I'd like to address today is what you should expect from that pastor. Before us is a text that is about a miracle of Jesus. Jesus causes the miracle of a great catch of fish. But Jesus himself, at the end of these verses, says to Peter, what has just happened in the real world, in this world of fishing, was an illustration of what should happen in the church. You who were my instrument to catch these fish are now going to be my instrument to catch people, to catch souls. So we should look at this miracle as an illustration of Jesus. He is using the aspects of fishing in order to illustrate what pastors should do and what you, the people, should expect from them. So today especially we will consider that you should expect your pastor to be prepared, you should expect him to confess, And you should expect him to catch, also. By way of preparation, modern seminary training is fundamentally no different than the training that Peter had. In seminary, we cover many topics. We obviously learn the teachings of the Bible. We learn false teachings that have competed with the gospel. We learn about the history of the Christian church and all the people who have influenced it in that history. 
And of course, then we seminarians begin to build these pillars of wisdom so that we can apply in a sensitive way God's word to you, his people. That all goes into a seminary training. And there are practical skills too. Public speaking, making bulletins, conducting the liturgy, and so forth. But what runs through all of these fields of preparation is knowing and preaching Christ. So seminarians, just like Peter, we sit and watch Jesus teach and serve and finally suffer and die for us as the Savior. We hear from him the message that he wants us to proclaim to his people. Whatever it is that's heavy on your mind, be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. You are a child of God through faith and God will never leave you. So we go through basically the same training that Peter did. God's word goes in and pastors of the church come out. You should expect your pastor to be prepared in this way. To be prepared with an intimate knowledge of Christ, our Savior. You should also expect your pastor to be prepared with the tools that Jesus gives his church to use. Peter and his companions used physical nets to catch the fish in the Sea of Galilee called um, Lake Gennesaret here in this text. The net that Jesus gives to his church to catch people are his means of grace. The word of God is the net that pastors cast out into the world and by that net people are brought into the church. And from the word of God, of course, we also have baptism, And we have the Lord's Supper, these tools that God authorizes pastors of the church to use for the building up and the increase of that church. So you should expect that your pastor will be prepared to competently cast that net of the word out in your midst and into the midst of the world. You should also expect that your pastor will confess. Generally, we use the word confess in multiple ways, but the basic meaning of that word to confess is to speak the truth, to say true things. You should expect, first of all, that your pastor will confess his own sin. And when we talk about confessing sin, we're merely speaking the truth about our sin. We're being open and honest about it. Seminary training, uh, if it is done right, does not make a person feel higher and holier than all the rest. In fact, it's just the opposite. An intimate extended connection with the Holy God in the person of Jesus Christ and with his word makes pastors realize just how unworthy and spiritually weak we are. Peter knew what it was like to sin. He would find that out very clearly in his time with Christ. When Peter walks out on the water with Jesus, He begins to doubt and he thinks. When Jesus is being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter draws his sword and gets violent and Jesus has to tell him, put your sword away. And when, of course, Jesus is being put on trial, Peter denies knowing him at all. So Peter knew what it was like to fall in this way. But he also knew how to confess his sin. And you should expect that your pastor, too, will live out his Christianity in daily repentance. You should also expect your pastor to confess the Christian faith, confess the truth of God's word. Again, we go back to that simple definition of confess. To confess the Christian faith means to say what's true about the Christian faith, what's true about God and his word. In this account, we can see Peter doing this a little bit. For the beginning of the verses, Peter addresses Jesus as master. He recognizes his authority as a teacher. But at the end of the verses, after he's seen this great miracle, he calls Jesus Lord. Now, Lord could be also a term of high respect and honor in New Testament times. But later on in the Gospel, Peter shows, he fleshes out what that confession of Lord really means. When Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you, Lord, are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. So your pastor will say what is true about God as he reveals himself in his word. 
And confession of the truth doesn't just happen with words. It also happens with actions. Peter, again, is an example of this. Just in this text, when Jesus gives the illogical command to go fishing in the middle of the day when there had been no success earlier, Peter, in faith, lets down his nets. Peter left everything after seeing this miracle and followed Jesus. At the beginning, he's there listening to him teaching. So also in a similar way, you will expect that your pastor will confess his faith in very concrete actions. He will live a holy life, you know, for the world to see that this Christian morality transcends what's, what's popular in the culture. You'll expect him to hold countercultural positions if God's word determines that he has to. You will expect him to preach scriptural sermons to you and to use hymns and liturgies that properly present the truths of the Bible. And in doing this, you will expect that your pastor will confess everything. He will confess his own sin. He will confess the truth, both by what he says and by what he does. Another thing you will expect your pastor to do is catch. Peter, in this lesson, catches fish. But as I said before, Jesus is telling Peter at the end of this lesson that what happened on the lake is what's going to happen spiritually through Peter and other pastors. Jesus promises that when the net of his word goes out into the world, there will be a catch. People will miraculously come into the church and believe in Christ. Pastors and members of churches alike, we want to see the large, miraculous catch like we see exemplified in the fish. We want to see people coming in droves into the church. When we don't see this happening, there is the temptation to doubt. There's the temptation to doubt whether the tools that our pastor is using are really the right tools for the job. There's always the temptation to change what we teach from God's word so that people will find it easier to accept, that they will want to hear it more. Or we might blame God for his methods. We might say, God, why did you ask us to go out fishing in the middle of the day? when we obviously hadn't caught anything in the better time for fishing at night. What does God really know about catching souls in the 21st century, we might ask ourselves. Why would he ask us to continue to bring the gospel to these people who are so hostile to it, or who are apathetic to it, who don't seem to care? But Jesus tells us, trust my word and let down the nets. See, here's an important point to understand about God's Word, about this net that we are given to use. God's Word is not just information. God's Word is not just information. If God's Word were just information, the lesson would look something like this. Jesus would have called Simon over to him and he would have shown him a a topographical map of the lake and he would have said, here's where the fish tend to be. And according to the lunar cycle and the temperature and the weather, here's where you should be able to find them. Now go and catch fish. But that's not what Jesus did. Even when it seemed that everything was hopeless, Jesus said, go and let down the nets and my word will accomplish the catch of fish. So God's word is not just information. It is primarily power. It is power for salvation. Here's what God says about his word through the prophet Isaiah. He says, My word that goes out from my mouth, it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. In those terms, God's word is not informing anyone. It's accomplishing things. It's achieving things. It does things in the world. So you may not always be privileged to see the physical effects of your pastor's faithful work in the form of more people in the church, more fish in the boat, if you will. But trust that just as surely as those fish in the Sea of Galilee, which did not want to come into the net, were compelled to come in, so also God's word will accomplish its purpose according to the work of the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, as you call a pastor, whenever that may be, you should expect these things of him. 
Expect that he will be prepared with the knowledge of Christ and with the tools of the means of grace. You should expect that he will confess both his own sin and the truth. And you should expect a catch by God's grace. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.